You've told me nothing about your condition. That no, I haven't. Give that little sweetheart a little bit of love. Thank you, baby. Sick friends. And we have so many lovely insects and uh, all kinds of birds and animals who don't harm at all. In fact, they've never been harmed by anything down here in the terms of being bit or anything. Tommy's come such a long way. He's not afraid of anything now. Such a good student. He's on the honor roll. Thank you, Tommy. That's, well, Tommy's all right. He you can tell he's not afraid. But that's a gentle guy. Walking stick now, if that isn't too much. People play games, friend. They lie, they lie. What can I do about liars? Are you people going to leave us? I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. Anybody wants to get out of here can get out of here. We have no problem about getting out of here. They come and go all the time. I don't know what kind of game. People like, like, who, who, people like publicity. Some people do. I don't. Reflecting back on the horrific events that took place on November the 18th, 1978, in Jonestown, Guyana, childhood friends of Jim Jones told Rolling Stone that he displayed alarming behavior even as a young child. He was obsessed with religion and death. He was obsessed with control. He captured animals and conducted experiments on them. He locked his friends in a barn and wouldn't let them leave and he professed admiration for people like Adolf Hitler. Yet he managed to create a public image of altruism that to some degree still lingers to this very day. How did he manage to fool so many people? And what can we learn from the tragedy that happened that day? This video is about Jonestown, but it's not strictly Jim Jones' story. Rather, this is the story of Catherine Edwards Thrash, also known as Hyacinth one of the only survivors who remained amongst the bodies of more than 900 people they had lived with, cared for, and loved, waiting for a rescue team to arrive. Hyacinth was 52 years old in 1957 when she crossed paths with Jim Jones and his church, which would eventually be called the People's Temple, but was first named Wings of Deliverance, a mere two years after the church was founded. Hyacinth had been born in 1905 in Alabama. She had six siblings and was especially close to her little sister Zipporah, four years younger than her, who they all called Zip affectionately. Zip was the baby of the family, and Hyacinth recalled that everyone spoiled her, even her siblings. Hyacinth was quiet and obedient, and Zip was a bit more mischievous. As they grew up, Zip was great at sewing, like their mother, and so she made a lot of the clothes for the family. Hyacinth was not a very good seamstress, but she was a perfectionist, so she helped Zip to perfect the hems of the clothing. Zip also liked to sing. Hyacinth described Zip and her other sister, Lena, as having beautiful voices. But Hyacinth said she was not a talented singer, saying, quote, I could not even cool soup with my voice. End quote. Hyacinth was very good at sport, though, and she particularly liked to play baseball. Growing up in the Jim Crow era South, there was segregation and fear, and the education at the schools for black kids was pretty abysmal. Black kids only had four months of school a year, whilst the white kids had nine. Hyacinth didn't even hear about Africa until she was an adult. Lynchings were common, and the Ku Klux Klan was gaining traction. Hyacinth lost her grandfather in a lynching. So Hyacinth's family moved to Indiana with the hopes of a more peaceful existence. Being deeply religious, they joined the Baptist church. Life was a lot better. But while there was limited segregation in public spaces, segregation still existed in the social fabric of the community. Black people were not allowed into the theater, and some white people would not sit next to black people on the bus. The segregation was particularly visible in churches. Zip saw Jim Jones preaching on a TV broadcast and she convinced Hyacinth to accompany her and see him preach in person. They both joined the church soon after. The church was a big deal. 
It was one of the first major non-segregated churches in the whole Midwest. Jim Jones preached about ending homelessness, poverty, and ending discrimination, and many people were drawn to his charisma and obviously also this message. He became very well known for his work to support the homeless population. Hyacinth and Zip were also heavily involved, cooking meals and serving up to 200 people every week. Jim was also becoming known as a healer. Hyacinth developed a lump in her breast. Jim prayed over her, and a few days later, the lump was gone. She considered it a miracle. And he performed what other people considered miracles too, and his reputation as a healer grew. However, a few years later, Hyacinth developed a tumour in her spine. And when they removed it, something went wrong and she could no longer walk properly. Jim said he would pray for her, but Hyacinth was not cured. She later said that she was convinced that he had the gift of healing at the beginning, but then he went down the wrong road and God took his gift away. Later, he would fake healings and pretend people were coughing out cancers that were really just chicken livers. He also frightened his congregation by talking about the end times and saying that they might have to resort to cannibalism. In the 1960s, it was the middle of the Cold War and people were very nervous about potential nuclear attacks. Jim Jones was one of those people and he had heard that California was a safer place to be in the event of an attack. I have no idea where the theory behind that reasoning was, but regardless, he moved the congregation to California in 1965, and about 150 people followed him, including Hyacinth and Zip. While many of the members from Indiana were people like Hyacinth, people from lower income backgrounds, and a large percentage of them black people trying to find a better future than the childhoods they had under Jim Crow laws, Many of those who joined in California were civil rights activists and anti-war activists from middle-class backgrounds. This also further legitimized Jim Jones in these progressive circles. And Jim knew exactly how to increase his influence. He donated to causes such as the Police Widows Fund and the NAACP. He also donated a lot of money to the local media. And this would later dissuade any investigative journalist from investigating him because the editors of those newspapers would simply squash the story. He was being compared to leaders such as Martin Luther King, and the mayor even elected him to the Housing Authority Commission. Ronald Reagan was governor of California at that time, and he was closing down hospitals, and so many mentally ill people were ending up on the streets. So Hyacinth used her savings to buy and set up a care home in California for mentally ill patients, which Hyacinth and Zip managed. Many other care homes or homes for runaway kids were set up by the People's Temple members too. A lot of other members had small businesses or were getting social security checks, all of which went to Jim Jones. Hyacinth said any income that they made in California would go to him. Hyacinth also later said that she didn't think all of Jim's money was ever found, as he stashed so much of it offshore. Zip was totally sold on Jim and would not hear a bad word about him. But Hyacinth started to see some things that were concerning to her. She really liked Jim's wife, Marceline, and she was upset that this man who had once been so devoted to his wife and who preached about not cheating on your spouse was now sleeping with other women in the congregation. In 1968, Jim was threatening to have Marceline committed to a mental institution because she wanted to leave him. She didn't want to lose her children, and so she stayed. Zip and Hyacinth both didn't have kids to care for them, and like many other members of the congregation, they didn't have pensions. So Jim Jones promised the members of the People's Temple, many of whom were elderly, that he was going to set up an old age home in California and make sure they were cared for for the rest of their lives. This was a very strong incentive for many to stay, even if they disagreed with him. But first, they were told they would all go on a mission trip to Guyana. Probably just for one year, you know, just to help the Guyanese get on their feet. What was really happening, and what few members knew, was that members who displeased Jim were being beaten and abused. Children were rewarded for informing on their parents. And Jim, while never showing off his wealth, was secretly enriching himself by exploiting members of his congregation. And this got out. So two investigative journalists started looking into Jim, and he knew he had to leave the country or risk being exposed and arrested. 
so he convinced many members of his congregation that it was necessary to go to Guyana for this mission trip for a year. Hyacinth and Zip flew to Guyana in July of 1977. They never got their passports back from Jim. People arrived in large numbers and set up a community called Jonestown. All the children today, all the children of Jonestown are having a fun day parade. They're having a fun day parade and they're going all around Jonestown and showing their happiness and how, how well they love it here in Jonestown. And as you can see how all happy they are and they really love it here in Jonestown as you can see. They, and going around y'all see all the seniors and, and show how, how joyful they are. Hyacinth and Zip lived with two other women in a wooden cottage with a tin roof. The tin roof made the cottage unbearably hot in the sun. Jim, on the other hand, had a nice air-conditioned house with screens to keep out the flies. While everyone else had to use cold communal showers, Jim had hot and cold running water. The community members made wooden toys and dolls, and anything they could grow, like bananas, were sold instead of being given to the community to eat. Hyacinth said they ate mostly white rice and occasionally some vegetables and beans. But once Jim's adopted daughter Agnes gave Hyacinth some leftover foods that she had snuck out from a meeting between Jim and his inner circle. Hyacinth was surprised to see jello, coffee, salad, and meat. The inner circle, by the way, was comprised mostly of white people, so so much for Jim and his talk of equality. The community had a bakery open all week but the community members could only have baked goods on Sundays. The rest of it was all sold. Hyacinth found it very difficult to walk around in the unsteady terrain with her cane, so she had to stay in the cottage most of the time. But other women, old women, were forced to work to grow crops. Some people there were over 100 years old. And while Marceline tried to make sure everyone got medical care because she was a nurse, Soon, the vitamins, medicine, and food started running out. Hyacinth later said, quote, I guess Jim knew he was going to do something else and didn't bother to keep up his flies. End quote. Jim was increasing his culture of fear. He had people write and sign false confessions to crimes and immoral deeds, and he kept a stack of these letters as blackmail. Their mail was controlled very strictly, and they didn't get news from the outside. Quote, the only news we had of the outside was from Jim over the loudspeaker. He'd tell us about the movie stars who died, and said the US was going under. Be glad you're out of there, he said. With me, it went in one ear and out the other. He was just trying to get folks down on the US. He called on people to tell them what a hard life they had in the US, and how Jim saved them. End quote. Jim had bodyguards and henchmen protecting him and doing his dirty work. Quote, it didn't do any good to complain. Complainers just came up missing. Besides, I'm not a complainer. I always try to do my part. I was just hoping one day I would get out of there. I was just hoping some way one would come along. I was praying God would get me out. One 60-year-old lady was accused of complaining about Jim. So his henchmen slapped her and Jim called her a bitch. Jim never laid his hands on the people. He had his henchmen do the dirty work. Then Jim made her take off all of her clothes and walk up and down the aisle of the pavilion, nude. And the pavilion was full of people, 900 of them. I couldn't look. I just sat at the back and held my ha head down with my hands. The next day, I met her on the path, and she turned her face from me. I said, don't you turn your face. We hugged and kissed right there on the path. I told her I was sorry for her and to not be ashamed, since she couldn't help it. End quote. At this point, people were starting to starve, and starving people will do desperate things. Jim obviously knew this, so he upped the ante and started doing suicide drills. He kept saying that mercenaries were going to come through the forest and kill them all. Hyacinth never participated in a suicide drill, but Zip did and came back and told her about it. 
She said he would convince them to drink Flavor-Aid and tell them it contained cyanide, but it didn't. At this point, he was doing a lot of drugs, and all he talked about was sex. He would make women stand up and say, you haven't been f***ed until you've been f***ed by Jim. He would make young white women act as his nurses, wearing only bikinis. He told wild stories, saying the CIA and FBI were coming for them, and that they were all going to escape to Russia, and then later he said that Russia would only accept him and his family. Hyacinth said they didn't think he was dangerous, just crazy. A couple of people defected and made it back to the United States, where they told journalists and politicians what was happening in Jonestown. And so, on November the 17th, 1978, Congressman Leo Ryan went to Jonestown with a group of journalists and also relatives who were concerned about people stuck there, to investigate the story for himself. At first they wouldn't let him in, but then Jim relented, and the cult members put on quite a show, convincing Leo Ryan that they were happy and they wanted to stay. Until one brave family broke ranks and asked Leo Ryan to go back with him. Ryan said anyone who wanted to leave could leave, and he would send more planes for others if he couldn't take enough on that trip. Hyacinth was in her cottage that day, so she didn't witness any of this, but Zip came in and told her the whole story. Hearing this, Hyacinth was desperate to leave, but she was so afraid to tell Zip, because Zip may have told Jim. Zip went back out for a while, and then returned, looking concerned, and asked Hyacinth to go to the pavilion, because Jim had important news to share. Zip said Jim would be angry if Hyacinth didn't go. Hyacinth said, then he'll have to come and drag me out because I am not going. Another woman who lived with them entered the cottage and said that there was news that something bad had happened at the airstrip after Ryan left, but Jim was refusing to tell them what happened and that they would tell Hyacinth what he had said when they returned to the cottage later. At this point, Hyacinth could hear Jim calling everyone over the loudspeaker, telling them to down their tools and stop cooking and come to the pavilion. Everyone left, but Hyacinth stayed behind. A while later, she heard the first gunshots in the dark. She immediately pulled herself under her bed to hide. Outside her window, she heard voices calling the name of another woman who must have been hiding from them. Hyacinth then realized they were firing the gun to scare people out of their hiding places. She thought this was absurd, the length that Jim would go to just to get people to the pavilion to hear his stupid speech. But she squeezed into the corner between the bed and the door. She weighed only 89 pounds at this point. But nobody came into her cottage. When it went quiet again, she figured they must have left and crawled back into bed. She dozed off and then woke up at 6am the next morning. She looked around the room and saw that Zip and the others hadn't returned yet. She thought to herself that Jim must still be ranting and she went back to sleep. She woke up again at 8am and got dressed to go outside and have breakfast. It was eerily quiet. She could not hear or see anyone. So she went over to the next cottage of another elderly woman that she was friends with called Birdie. Birdie was sitting in a chair with a sheet draped over her head. Hyacinth knew it was Birdie, only by her shoes. Thinking this was very strange, Hyacinth called out to her. Birdie, what's going on? What's wrong? Birdie didn't answer. Hyacinth approached and looked behind her into the cottage. In the beds, there were other people sitting or lying, all covered in sheets. She pulled down one of the sheets and realized in horror, they were all dead. The next part I'm going to read from Hyacinth's account directly so you can hear it in her own words. Quote, I said, Oh my God, they came and killed them all, and I is the onlyest one alive. Why didn't they take me too? I started screaming. I thought maybe I was dead too. I pinched myself. Was I alive? I couldn't believe it. I just stood there. And I thought of Zip and Esther and Ruth and realized they must all be dead. I could see down to the kitchen, and the light was on. Sandwiches were just on the table, some covered, some not, like they had just been left. 
I started shaking all over, crying and wringing my hands. I was standing there, seeing all those bodies covered with sheets. And I heard a voice, just as plain, like a radio playing behind you in the distance, saying, Fear not, I am with you. I believe it was the Spirit of the Lord. I looked around, dropped my hands, and the fear left me. I went back to my cottage, climbed up on the steps, and sat down in my chair. I sat there for a long time. Then I thought I'd better call for help. So I took a big white towel and went outside and waved it real hard. But there was nobody to see it. There wasn't a sound. We kept powdered milk and a plastic jug of water in our cottage, so I mixed up some milk and drank it. That's all I had that day, that and some water. It rained real hard during that night, Saturday. You could tell by the sand washed up on the plank pathways. But Sunday was bright and clear. Jungle birds were singing so pretty. So I just sat there, listening to the birds. Late Sunday, I got up and thought I might try to escape through the jungle. But there was a real steep cliff and vines were hanging low. I was scared I might fall with my cane and pass out. And no one would find me. So I went to the outhouse and sat down. I always had a problem from all that white rice. I must have dozed off. When I woke up, it was getting daylight. So I just sat there and watched the sun come up. It was pretty. Then when the sun started beating down real hot, I went back to my cottage. And that's when the soldiers from Georgetown came in. Were they ever surprised to see me? Their eyes were as big as moons. They said, Lady, what are you doing here? When I told them, they said not to be scared and that nothing would happen to me now. Then they took me out and walked me down to the pavilion to show me what had happened. It was like a battlefield, bodies strewn all over, dead people and dead dogs. They wanted me to help identify bodies, but I told them I couldn't do it. It's awful hard looking at dead folks when you talked to them just a couple of days before. Awful hard seeing your friends dead. I identified my sister though, from a distance. She was laying straight, on her back, about two feet from a white lady, just outside the pavilion, on the dirt floor. Her left arm was over her waist, with her thumb up. Her right arm was straight by her side. I couldn't get close to touch her, for all the bodies laying around. But I didn't want to touch her. Pictures in the newspaper later made it look like everybody was linking arms to show they were all in this together. But I don't believe it. I think the bodies were placed that way. Cyanide poisoning is a horrible way to die. And I don't believe they all would have linked arms when they were suffering. I saw Patty Cartmill too. She was one of Jim's henchmen from the early days. She was laying in the drainage ditch. Her hair was floating. I think she tried to run away. My old friend, Grover Smith, came back out of the jungle where he had been hiding. Was he surprised to see me? He had snuck back the day before to get bananas from the banana shack to take back to the jungle. And he didn't know I was still alive all that time. He kept telling me, Hyacinth, don't say anything about Jim. You see, he still believed Jim had powers, even though he was dead. They wanted me to go down and see Jim, where he was laying with his head on his throne pillow. But I didn't want to. They said his eyes were open, like he was seeing something terrible. I believe he is in torment. End quote. Jim Jones had shot himself, allowing himself a much kinder death than his followers. There were needles all over the pavilion, indicating that some people didn't drink the poison flavor aid they were injected with it, and some were shot when they tried to run. A couple of people, including Jim's son Stephen, was in Georgetown at the time, and that's why they survived the massacre. Hyacinth was taken to the airstrip so she could fly to Georgetown and then back to the United States. By that stage, she had learned what had happened to Leo Ryan. He was followed to the airstrip by Jim's henchmen, who opened fire on the group trying to board the plane, killing Ryan and many others. It was then that Jim realized the jig was up. He would definitely be arrested. So he called everyone to the pavilion and brought out vats of poison flavor aid, 
and told his followers that mercenaries would be coming to kill them and they needed to save their children and elderly from an even worse death. As Hyacinth boarded the small plane and took her seat, she thought of Ryan and ducked down below the window, afraid someone would shoot at her. At the embassy, she met up with another survivor, Odell Rhodes. He was present for the massacre. The next part I'm reading is what Hyacinth remembers him telling her. Quote, We talked about how people looked after they died, how the babies died in Odell's arms. He'd have to hold them, he said. There were 28 babies, and they were having convulsions. Odell said he cried till he had no more tears. He said Jim was hurrying the people up, telling them to be brave. Some were running around, saying they didn't want to die. It was pitiful to hear Odell tell it. Bodyguards were saying, every goddamn one of you is going to die. Some tried to run away, but they got shot down or clubbed down with sticks, Odell said. One girl tried again and again to give the poison to her baby. Finally, she did it, and then gave it to herself, and then walked down to the riverbank to die. One 11 or 12-year-old girl told Odell, I'm too young to die. Odell fooled the inner circle by offering to go get a stethoscope, but then he ran out into the jungle. End quote. Hyacinth had Zip's body transported to Los Angeles, where she buried her. She said, quote, I dream about her often, like when we were still together, talking and doing things. Two of my nieces heard her calling, like she wants to tell them something. I wish she would. I look for her to come to me again and to tell me. She'd probably tell me not to worry, not to get mixed up with another antichrist. I miss her so much. We used to have such good times together. Folks didn't blame me for getting mixed up with Jim. I didn't feel shamed either. Anybody can be fooled. Well, to tell the truth, at first I did feel shamed. But then I thought, you're the only one of more than 900 people who refused to go down to that pavilion, and you lived. End quote. Hyacinth Thrash died in 1995 at the age of 90. And that is the story of Jonestown and Hyacinth Thrash. Thank you for clicking on this video and for watching it. If you like this video, click like, click subscribe, leave me a comment. All of these things help me and my channel, and I really do appreciate it. See you next time.